Hello everyone. Welcome to Easel Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. In today's episode, we're going to be discussing hepatic encephalopathy, underdiagnosed and underestimated. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, to be joined by uh, uh, an incredible uh, uh, expert uh, panel and privileged to also be joined by uh, Mr. Stephen Rodriguez, who is a patient who is very bravely going to share uh, some of his story with us today. Uh, and I'm also joined uh, by uh, Dominic Taboo from Paris, uh, who's a, 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 an expert in hepatic encephalopathy and Christian Lebens from Mainz in, in Germany. And my name is Debbie Shawcross uh, and I'm based at King's. So Stephen, maybe if we could start with you. I yeah. know that you were first diagnosed with hepatic encephalopathy roughly four years ago when you were hospitalized. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think you could describe for us um, what happened with your presentation? Can you remember anything about it that you can share or any symptoms that you had? Yeah, yeah, I can. I can, I can remember it very, very vividly. I've gone to, I think I've gone for a shower, not come back. It was a morning time. And then mum came in the bedroom. And I can still remember, I was sat on the edge of the bed and she was only one. And I can still remember now. She said, what are you doing? So I'm talking to a dog. I can still remember a grey, a little grey dog, a wolfhound dog with a beard. And, and I said, it's going to have to go, though. She said, well, why is that, Steve? So I said, it's the same. I'm doing that. I can still recall. I said, it's the same colour as the two cows behind me. There were two cows, the same colour as the dog behind the shape of cow, but they were exactly the same colour as the dog. And I can remember, and I can still see this in my mind's eye, as if it was yesterday, to the right of me, there was uh, three ladies dressed in Charleston gear. And I can still remember them. There were... It was, a, it was a big half moon, really posh Victoriana type dressing table, black, with a big mirror in the middle, with, with bulbs and all, sort of like you see in the dressing room, with, with mirrors on the other side. There was one lady sat cross-legged, one lady was stood up straight to the right of her, and the lady closest to me, and I can still see her now as I'm talking to you, she was sort of more or less sort of leaning back, and she had a beautiful silver sparkly dress on with the... Charleston headgear. It, it, it was, I can still see that as, like I say, it was four years ago, it was, it was yesterday. And, and after that, um, obviously, mum knew there was a problem. Um, I don't remember anything about speaking to somebody when she dialed 101. I remember nothing about the doctor coming into, he took one look at me. By that time, I was quite yellow and bloated. He took one look at me and said to me, mum and, and a good friend that was there at the time, I need to go to hospital, but it's quicker to go in a car and I have no recollection then until I woke up on the ward about four or five days later at the Royal Lancaster Infirmary, it's about half an hour from me. Oh, but in God. that time, mum was told that it was very unlikely that I would, I would pull through. That must have been very scary for you, Steve. Do, do you think you had any symptoms before this happened? Were there any warning signs that you could sort of remember that things weren't quite right? Yeah, there's there's a couple of things. Well, one thing I can remember, what I don't remember, and, and, and mum describes it in her own story that she's written online through the British Liver Trust, is that my in the, mum came up early for Christmas. I wasn't well. December was quite a blur. I think this is where it was all starting. So she came up earlier for Christmas. And with my behaviour, I'm really close to mum, but my behaviour towards mum, or she actually describes it in her own words as like living with an alien. I wasn't Steve, her son. I was horrible. I was nasty. I was bad tempered. And that is, I'm a very generally happy go lucky type of fella. And, and I've heard more and more, mum's opened up more and more over the past, certainly a couple of years, as to how I was. But that, that was my behavioral patterns of bad. But also, I can still remember just actually where I was now. I was by a coffee table one, one, one day, and I can remember re again really vividly thinking there was a sniper in the spare bedroom. And then the next minute I'm on my tummy, crawling over up the corridor, and then rolled over onto my tummy and said, right, I've got him, shot him dead. And that must be, that must have been horrendous for mum to see, but she recalls one story where, again, I'd gone to the bedroom, not come back, and I was lying by the side of the bed, and I had a pair of sort of Timberlake, Timberlake, Timberland style boots on end, and I, I thought I was convinced they were the pillows. I, she said, you'd had the wherewithal to pull the duvet off the bed, but you're mm -hmm. on your knees, pressing a pair of boots as if they were a pillow. I mean, absolutely such strange, 
strange behaviour. And of course, it then it, then it all came to to a head on January the fifth in two thousand twenty. Okay, and 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 had you seen any other doctors or sort of health care professionals in the six months leading up to this? Had anybody sort of assessed you or uh, talked to you about any of your symptoms? No, they had. I mean, my my doctor is a terrific guy, but I, I only ever really saw my doctor in terms of my drinking when I know that was that was bad. But it, it, you know, maybe a discussion for another day as such. But I still re regret not telling him how much. I was drinking. I know that's not an uncommon thing, still not right, but no, we only ever really discussed, never discussed anything like that. I was never aware of it. Um, I only really discussed my my um, my drinking habits and obviously the effect it could have on my liver, but nothing to do with HE, no. Okay, okay. So Christian, I'm going to bring you in now. Um, and, and I wonder really if you could sort of talk us through why it's so important for physicians to diagnose hepatic encephalopathy uh, early. Why is it so important? Thank you very much for this question, Debbie. And first, thank you very much, Steve, for being here and sharing your story with us. I think this is really important for every physician uh, joining Easel Studio. I, mean, I think it is so important to diagnose hepatic encephalopathy as early as possible, because we all know hepatic encephalopathy is a very, very serious complication of cirrhosis, as it not only is associated with impairments of quality of life for our patients, but what's also very important is that it's a huge burden for the respective caregivers. We heard this in Steve's story, what was going on with him. And that means hepatic encephalopathy affects the entire family and not just the patient. So. We also have newer studies, or more or less newer studies, that also indicate that the higher grades of hepatic encephalopathy might not be completely reversible. And there could also be some brain damage that might remain even after liver transplantation. And therefore, I think the management of patients with cirrhosis should include strategies to screen for HE as early as possible and so that we can detect even the lowest grades of hepatic encephalopathy and could subsequently prevent progression. Thank you. And I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot now. I mean, how do we do that? We're busy physicians, gastroenterologists, hepatologists or, or, or primary care physicians. How do we go about sort of assessing patients potentially for encephalopathy? It's very true that we are busy. So I think we should follow our guidelines. And here the first step is always following the West Haven criteria. And we all know that the detection of higher grades of hepatic encephalopathy is more or less or comparably easy. However, the detection of patients with covert hepatic encephalopathy, the two lowest grades of hepatic encephalopathy, is often a bit more complicated. And to detect patients with lower grades, we need a nice set of specific questions and uh, specialized tests if available. And, you know, are there any sort of practical questions? If we're seeing patients like Steve in our clinics or may maybe in, in, in the surgery, how are, are there any sort of things that we can ask? Are there any sort of top tips that you have? Yeah, I think Steve's story really nicely demonstrates what the signs and symptoms of hepatic encephalopathy are in daily life and what we need to ask in our outpatient departments. And I think it is easiest for us if the patient is accompanied by a close family member who knows this patient well and could complete the medical history where we ask our questions. And as examples, you should always ask for changes in personality. Steve described this very good. And you should ask for slight problems with concentration, sleep problems, reversal of day and night rhythm, and you should also ask for falls, which are quite common in these patients. And this will give you an idea of whether HE might be present or not. And afterwards, we need testing strategies for slight cognitive deficits. Okay, and you mentioned uh, uh, screening, Christian. I mean, are, are there any particular tests that you use, neuropsychometric neuropsych tests, for example? Yeah. First, I do my, my medical history, and then I go for uh, 
testing. And uh, as you all know, our guideline recommended gold standard for detection of minimal hepatic encephalopathy is the psychometric hepatic encephalopathy score or short FEST. In Mainz, um, we use this test a lot, but uh, to be honest, mostly for research purposes, because we all know FEST is quite elaborate, takes a lot of time, often 20 to 25 minutes. Therefore, it's not easily implementable into routine care, to be honest. So, but in my outpatient department, I usually test my patients with the animal naming test, which is a good test that is free of any additional costs, takes just 60 seconds, and you get a good impression on um, your cognitive form of your patient. And I also frequently add Stroop and Cephalac because it's easily done and quite quick. Thank you. And I'm going to bring you in now, Dominique, if that's OK. Um, would you do anything differently to Christian? H how do you approach this? Well, thank you for the question, Debbie. And myself, I also want to thank Steve, because it's very important to hear and that everybody hears how patients suffer from hepatic encephalopathy and how it can be really something which is bringing fear into their lives. So I'm practically doing the same thing as Christian, which is not a surprise. The only thing is that FEST is probably, it's a very good test, very specific, probably the best one. But as you said, it's more in research setting because it's very elaborate and complicated and time consuming. So how am I doing practically? First of all, I'm asking the patient the complaints he has. And this is very important for me because after all, what is important is the complaint of the patient. If he doesn't suffer, well, that's okay. So I'm asking the complaints and I'm asking two very simple questions. The first one is, are there things you were doing before and you are not able to do now because of lowering or because you forget things? And that's something that is speaking to them. And I'm also asking the relative when he's there, the next of kin, saying maybe some of them will say, oh, but yes, you don't remember, but you forgot some, some, something, you know. So that's important to ask the two of them when they are accompanied by somebody. The second thing I'm asking is also car accidents all the time, because I think it's meaningful, like false, like Christian says. And so with those two questions, then like Christian, I'm performing animal naming tests routinely in my outpatient clinics. But for FES or other tests, I'm just devoting them for research settings. I and think that asking the patient is the most important thing, really. Ab absolutely. And Steve, Steve, were you a driver? Were you driving? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I was driving. I surrendered uh, my license. I didn't actually have to officially surrender it. My doctor advised it was the best thing to do. But actually, yesterday, what I have to have now is an annual uh, medical uh, it is uh, from the DVLA. So yesterday I had another medical yesterday, which consisted of a full medical blood test. And I have to take my driving glasses with me and then a series of of questions uh, that I have to answer. And that all, it's not the doctor's decision, but that is done annually. Yeah. 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 So that, that again, reinforces the importance of picking this up uh, early. Oh, yeah. Um, and Dominique, um, we've talked about neuropsychometric tests. We've talked about things like the animal naming test. Um, do you do any other tests? I mean, uh, there's a lot of been there's been a lot of debate in the moment about measuring blood ammonia, for example. What what's your take on on that? Well, uh, for blood ammonia in my outpatient clinics like that, I'm not performing routinely blood ammonia. Blood ammonia is very useful in my practice uh, for the differential diagnosis because, as you know or uh, when ammonia uh, is normal, we have to, we should rule out hepatic encephalopathy and seek for other causes of, of encephalopathy. And for example, drug-induced encephalopathy and then stop some drugs, you know, or infection or other causes of hepatic, en of, hep of acute encephalopathy, sorry. So routinely in outpatient clinics, no, I'm just going for screening without ammonia. And when I can, I ask for a blood sample for next visit, but not the same day. This is very different in my hospitalized patients with a suspicion of over hepatic encephalopathy, of course. Okay, Where what about I'm doing ammonia uh, at the first uh, at the first episode all the time. And Christian, do you measure ammonia? I can only agree with Dominique. In hospitalized patients, we use ammonia 
quite a lot for differential diagnosis, but in the outpatient setting, to be honest, only for study purposes currently. Okay, thank you. So Steve, I'm going to come back to you now, and I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the treatments that you might have received for your encephalopathy. Can you remember uh, if you received any treatments and, and what they were? Um, when I came out of hospital, I have to say I didn't, uh, I'll come on to the medication in, in a second if that's all right, but I didn't really have much of an idea when I came out of hospital. I didn't have any didn't have an occupational therapist. I had um, a care package, which wasn't, they hadn't any idea of my condition. They, they didn't actually have any, any notes of what, of HE and what might happen to me. Um, so I didn't know that I would be prone to falling as it's been discussed before. I had a really nasty fall in the April. I was lucky I had a friend with me at the time, um, but no, not, not, not treatment as such, no physio. I didn't, there's, until I actually joined the British Liver Trust a year down the line, I knew really very little about HE. Um, but as far as medication goes, yeah, I was on lots of medication. I still am now. Um, so lactulose obviously is the is the one that um, I use on a on a on a regular basis. But obviously that that it was not a necessary evil. It's necessary uh, for me. I have that uh, three times a day. But that in itself, it, with the, it, you know, to be quite candid, it, you know, it, it, you do, it does make you go to the tour quite regularly. Yeah. So you have to be, like, for instance, to be honest this evening, I haven't taken mine earlier because I didn't want to be in this meeting. I have to rush off to the tour. So you, it's okay. necessary. And, and I, I appreciate I'll be on that probably for the rest of my life. But, but there, so that rixifarmin I was on for quite some time, but I had to come off that because it was, um, Another medication I was on, which was being for, for treating for my for some anxiety issues that I had, it was mixing with that and causing more more issues. But but yeah, medication is, is the main thing. But in terms of other treatment, no, not really, to be honest. And and do you find that if you don't have your lactulose, you you start to get symptoms back, or is that not so much of an issue for you now? No, it, it, well, it, it, in in the early in the early days, um, I wasn't. It was my my mistake. I wasn't taking lactulose. I was taking something else by mistake, and I can still remember one night ringing my friend up. Um, I, again, I was getting another case of HE, saying asking where she was because we were due to go and see an abitribute band of all things. Obviously, again, my 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 mind was playing tricks. The HE was was kicking in, but as soon as I went to back to the Royal Lancaster, they could tell from my diaphragm that when she mentioned lactulose, I was like, what's that? And and, and to, in all fairness, I stayed another night in hospital and they got on, and they did get onto that really quickly. But yeah, if I don't take it, I do know I get bloated. But obviously I have to take it, I have to take it. But there are times if I have an appointment or I might be on a journey, there are times I have to work around that. But I know that's not uncommon. I know that, that I talk mm -hmm. to other people but you have to take it. I mean, it's not the most pleasant of things. I always said that the last batch I had was probably in the last four years was probably the most palatable I've ever tasted. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually not unpleasant to drink. I did actually ring the pharmacy to ask if I could have it again, but they couldn't guarantee it. Oh, goodness so, me. So there's definitely brands. Tomorrow, so I'm keeping my fingers there's, crossed. It's there's soon. brands that are more popular than others. <laughs> um, and, 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 and Dominique, I mean, if you were... If you were, you know, you admitted Steve, Stephen to your ward and you'd diagnosed overt hepatic encephalopathy, how would you go about sort of approaching, managing him and, uh, uh, and treating him? Oh, OK, so first of all, there is where you hospitalize uh, the patient. And so in grade three or four, I tend to hospitalize them in ICU, otherwise in ward. That's the first thing, but that's uh, depending on, of course, uh, facilities. Uh, so after that, the first thing is to treat the acute phase. And first of all, I would uh, seek for a precipitating factor all the time, which could be infection, which could be bleeding, which could be medications, which should be uh, metabolic disorders, hyponatremia, whatever, and treat it. And that's the first thing. And of course, that start uh, the, uh, the, the treatment with lactulose first. And so... Uh, we do it uh, by mouth, if you can, otherwise by enema. And uh, after that, when the patient is getting better, 
uh, we try to think about secondary prophylaxis in order to pr prevent the other uh, occurrences of hepatic encephalopathy. In that setting, we always measure ammonia all the time, the first thing, uh, just to try, as I said, uh, to rule out other uh, causes of acute uh, encephalopathy. And so that's something that we really do. And then in our unit, we tend to measure ammonia often and try to have a decrease of ammonia, even if it's not proven that we should have an ammonia target, you know, but uh, we try to do it, I must say, also for research purposes. And then after the patient is going to home, for example, and we see him quite often uh, to check that uh, he's not uh, doing again a recurrence of hepatic encephalopathy and to start to measure also the degree of covert HE, uh, which is still there, you know, and try to monitor him like that. So that's how we do. And of course, there are special settings where we are going to discuss liver transplant and things like that. You know, it depends also on the degree of liver failure and uh, on uh, the whole uh, picture of the patient. Okay, th thank you. And, and, and Stephen mentioned that uh, uh, he'd been uh, prescribed rifaximin uh, at some point following that admission. Is that something that you would do on a first admission or would that be something that you would prescribe if, if there were any recurrences? So, well, in France, things are very clear because we are just allowed to prescribe rifaximin after the second recurrence of hepatic encephalopathy. So that is the authorizations of rifaximin. So we try to stick to that. Uh, and after, sometimes what happens is that the patient doesn't stand lactulose because of bloating, or as you said. Huh? And so in that time, uh, at that time, we can switch to rifaximin. And uh, of course, uh, sometimes I do it, even if it's, a little complicated in France right now. I tend to do it also if the patient doesn't stand uh, lactulose. The thing is to have a medication, you know. And uh, in case of recur recurrence, second recurrence, we try to associate lactulose and rifaximin in the patient take them. Thank you, thank you. And, and Christian, I, I guess um, Stephen was hospitalized, so he sort of was at the extreme end. But if you were sort of suspecting that a patient you saw in the clinic may have more minimal or covert hepatic encephalopathy. Um, how would you approach treating that if, if you, for example, had a positive animal naming test or a, a FES test? How would you go about sort of treat, treatment in that regard? This is a good question and it's not that easy to answer. And um, <laughs> I think I might need a bit of time for this because we have to answer this question in a somewhat differentiated way. So in general, the first step should always be in every patient who has decompensated cirrhosis or hepatic encephalopathy is that we have to optimize diet and tackle sarcopenia and frailty. We all know muscle is very important for ammonia metabolism and it is best if my patient has a lot of muscle. But when I think um, when we are talking about COVID hepatic encephalopathy, we have to keep in mind that patients might have clinically detectable symptoms if they suffer from hepatic encephalopathy grade one, or their cognitive deficits might only be detectable with specialized tests if they suffer from minimal hepatic encephalopathy. And in my opinion, every patient with hepatic encephalopathy grade one should be treated because they are symptoms. And the guideline recommended treatment of choice is obviously lactulose. We all know the side effects and Steve told us this, and I think the treatment should start, start as soon as possible to prevent progression, and we have to instruct our patient how to take lactulose. This is very important. In patients with minimal hepatic encephalopathy, the answer is obviously not that straightforward, to be honest, <laughs> as for patients with hepatic encephalopathy grade one. And I try to discuss the disease with my patient and the situation at home if there are any symptoms of minimal hepatic encephalopathy. And in most cases, I start a treatment trial with lactulose, which is a good choice and our first line treatment. And many patients benefit from this therapy. However, as mentioned, we know the side effects such as bloating, and it's not good for social life, to be honest. And this limits compliance, especially in patients with minimal hepatic encephalopathy. And 
Therefore, I think in some cases, it's not a bad idea to go with a trial with another treatment strategy that could be reasonable too. And another important point that um, has to be kept in mind in that patients is that they might also suffer from other diseases that lead to cognitive deficits and that are not treatable with lactulose. And I think in this context, it's a good example to talk about OSAS, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome, which is really quite frequent in our patients in the Western world <laughs> due to the massive epidemic, um, to be honest. And so when interpreting our MHE tests, and this is especially true for animal naming tests, which is not specific for minimal hepatic encephalopathy, and treating patients, we always have to keep in mind that um, we should treat our patient as a whole, and because otherwise there, it could be possible that there is no treatment benefit and that he or she has another problem that is not treatable with ammonia-lowering strategies. Thank you. And, and actually, we didn't really cover this at the start, but do you ever do brain imaging? Do you do CT or MRI or anything like that? It's part of your diagnostic workup. We do this in hospitalized patients, especially in those that don't uh, have an improvement to lactulose therapy, or we also use IV Lola. It's not available in, in every country. Um, in outpatients with only slight cognitive deficits, like minimal hepatic encephalopathy, I don't do any brain imaging except for studies. Okay, Feb. And what about you, Dominique? Well, it's the same. Uh, I, tr I well, I tend to do it once for each patient, brain imaging in the setting of overt HE for covert HE in case of doubt, and also because we try to phenotype very good all our patients for research is purpose. But each time I have a doubt, or each time I have a cofactor, which is very often after all, I'm doing a brain imaging. And, and can you remember, Steve? Did did anybody do a brain scan on on you? No, interestingly enough, I had to have a, t a CT scan for something else recently, and um, the nurse that took me through it said, oh, you've had one already, and I said, well, when was that? I don't remember. It was actually on the day, it was January the 5th, 2020. Mum remembers them taking me away, but I'd had a CT scan, I'd actually had one. Obviously, I don't remember, I was unconscious, so but I did actually have a CT scan on, on the day, a CT scan on the day that I was admitted, so yeah. Yeah. Okay. So very, did. Yeah. And, and Christian, yeah. Christian mentioned that um, diet and, and ha maintaining muscle mass is really important for treating hepatic encephalopathy. Did anybody talk to you uh, about diet or anything like that when, you know, as part of your treatment? Uh, I left hospital with a diet sheet. Um, but that was, as far as I was aware, that was mainly around liver cirrhosis. I didn't, you know, like I said, I didn't leave with anything, you know, regarding HE. And, and my mum and my brother that came up from London, they didn't really know. There wasn't an awful lot that was, that was said about HE in all fairness. Mm. So uh, do you think there's a bit of a, a gap there that, that, we, that we as doctors should be talking more to patients that are diagnosed with hepatic encephalopathy about the implications and, and how it should be? Be managed yeah definitely I, I think i think that this there obviously early diagnosis is absolutely vital and the earlier the, the earlier the better not just for the patient but for the patient's families because obviously in my case you know my case although this evening they're my personal experiences i know that they're not unique particularly the behavioral pattern so yeah most definitely most definitely that there that, that, that there should be much more awareness definitely Definitely. And I think that... Um, Thank you. Turn, go on. All right. No, no, carry on. No, 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 it's fine. No, it, 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 in terms of... In terms of um, a, there should be a better pathway, I think, when you leave hospital. I think there should be a... There should be a pathway for, for anyone that leaves hospital. There should be a, a, a set pathway. When I left hospital, I didn't have anything really. I didn't. I googled HE fairly late on when I was getting a bit better, but um, it wasn't until I joined the British Liver Trust about well, be twelve months later that I knew about HE and I got the, the the health passport that I have now. So I have a health passport that I keep in my car, which has got 
all the details of um, hepatic encephalopathy, the symptoms, what to do if somebody finds me. And I've also got a credit card that I keep in my wallet um, that tells people that I have HE that I'm being managed for liver conditions. And to me, that should be an absolute given that when you, if you're treated with what I had, then you should be given that. I shouldn't have had to wait 12 months until I found a British Liver Trust. And I know that it's not uncommon either. Yeah, no, no, we definitely we definitely can do better. I'm conscious of, of time. We've got about five minutes left. But um, Dominique, I was going to ask you, sometimes we treat patients with tips, particularly patients that have come with variceal bleeds or uh, are, are having a tips as part of a pathway to manage uh, large volume ascites. And um, how do you go about sort of managing the risk of HE in, in, in those sorts of patients? Because we haven't really covered that area. No, that's very important. Thank you, Debbie. That's addressing uh, portal hypertension in patients with ascites or bleeding and in patients with quite severe cirrhosis. So TIMS, TIPS is reputed uh, to uh, induce hepatic encephalopathy because of the shunt, the artificial shunt. And sorry, in fact, uh, we have uh, to distinguish two settings. The setting of emergent, urgent TIPS for variceal bleeding, for example. And in this case, we don't have any studies saying that we should uh, prevent HE. Uh, however, you will prevent HE in case of variceal bleeding with lactulose during the episode, for example, but nothing specifically for tips, but in the setting of elective tips, for example, uh, failures for, uh, of secondary prophylaxis of bleeding or refractory ascites or hydrothorax. We have studies now saying that giving rifaximin, for example, two weeks uh, before the TIPS placement is useful to decrease uh, hepatic encephalopathy after TIPS. So that's what we are doing in the setting of elective TIPS. We are doing 14 days rifaxinin, and then there is the TIPS, and during six months rifaxinin again. And this has been proven to prevent uh, HE. However, we also need studies in the urgent setting, of course, or preemptive setting that we don't have. So right now, we, we still don't do it. And would you do the same, Christian? Yeah, we do the same. Um, however, we usually add lactulose to those patients. But I agree that data are lagging, are lagging on this topic, especially for the combination of lactulose and rifaximin. However, we got the clinical experience, to be honest. Um, so it's good to prevent it. And I would hit a bit harder than lesser. So, yeah. Thank you. So uh, we're coming to an end now, but Steve, I want to give the, la the last word to you because you're, you're, you're the patient here. And I wonder if there's any takeaway message that we can all, we can all take from your experiences. What, what can we do uh, to improve the, uh, uh, the journey for, for other patients follow, following yourself uh, yeah. that may present in this situation? What, what, what can we do? Well, I, I think I said before, the early diagnosis is an absolute must. The earlier, the better, so that families are aware um, and the, obviously the patient is aware. And, and this pathway, you know, I've said that a bit earlier, that there has to be, there should be a set pathway. Because I, although this evening I've spoken about my own very personal experience, as I know that this evening I'm speaking on behalf of the people that have HE, the families, because they suffer the consequences just as much You've only got to hear my mum's story. My mum's story, again, isn't unique. But I also want to remember those of lost family members that had HE. Had they been aware earlier, they might have been able to get help earlier. I had a, a really wonderful message off a lady that I connected through the British Liver Trust that lost her mum. And so it's trying to give people like her a better understanding. But in future, that can help somebody even more and it is this awareness because I hear a lot on the Facebook group that I go that globally there's just not enough known about it there is not enough known about it if I could for instance if I could do this seven days a week I would do this to put the point across and I think it I really like say this evening to be a catalyst you know and it, because more needs to be done I think it, and you know obviously I, I'm, I'm here to tell the story and I feel very lucky you're very lucky and I'm really grateful that you've given me the opportunity to speak about my own experiences, but on behalf of all the other people I've, I've just mentioned, but, but it, it's so important that much more should be known about it. There's not enough, not enough. Like I say, had I not joined the British Liver Trust, I dread to think, I dread to think what, you know, I would have still known nothing about it now. 
Yeah, uh, I, I couldn't say put put things better myself. Uh, that that that's so true. So we're really at the end of the studio now. But Stephen, I would 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 personally, and I know the rest of the panel would really uh, like to thank you very much for for being very brave and sharing your story. I, I feel very humbled. I've learned an awful lot from you. Um, uh, and I thought I, I'd learned lots about hepatic encephalopathy, but I think we can all learn from our patients. And, uh, and it's great that you've shared your story. I really do hope that if there's patients and, and, and healthcare uh, uh, physicians and, uh, and other allied health professionals that are listening to this studio, that they can take some of the really important messages that you've all shared uh, today uh, uh, with them. So I'd, I'd like to thank you, Steve, and I'd like to thank you, Dominique and Christian, for your, for your expert advice and opinions and for sharing those. Um, and to wrap up the session and really um, thank you all and, and to say that next week um, please tune in for the final episode of the season so we've actually got a holiday special uh, which uh, concludes with a uh, with a look back at the Easel Studio for 2023 uh, and opens with how how we might uh, look at some exciting things happening in 2024. Uh, so please do join us for the final uh, studio of the season and remember to become a member and join the Easel family. So so thank you all, uh, and I wish everyone uh, a, a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.